Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good. It's good to see all of my school friends back again. Um, I'm here today to talk about retired annuitant fees. Um, you know, really, I should probably have Christina Rollins do this because of Tim's example, she's now in my upgraded position. But since so she's getting the contributions for that, you won't have to report for her. All right, that was my little joke on out of class appointments. All right, so, um, you know, um, last SEAC meeting, we talked about um, a way to avoid one of the, the late payroll fees, um, or even for retired annuitants, was that you can go in and confirm missing payroll. So you can go in, confirm that someone, um, you didn't have the payroll for them, and so then the fee wouldn't be assessed. Unfortunately, there was a defect in our system, and it was unfortunately assessing the fees. We have now obviously captured, we've caught that problem and it was fixed in our last release. So in reality, you shouldn't be getting any more fees on that. If you are getting fees where you confirm missing payroll, let us know and we'll work with our fiscal department to try to back that fee out for you. Um, you know, the good news is too, is now you can see future reports too, so you can go in there and confirm that missing payroll. I do wanna say though, if you're confirming missing payroll and then later you find out that there was payroll to report, please go back and report it. You won't be assessed a fee. But for audit purposes, if they go in there and they see that you didn't report that, they're going to make you go back and report it at that point. So that's one way that you can actually go in there and avoid getting these fees. Because we've heard your concerns that, you know, oftentimes you don't get those, um, the timesheets from the districts in a timely manner, especially for retired annuitants. And then your earned period report has um, went past the due date. And then you get assessed the fee. So this is one way that you can avoid getting that fee. So now we're gonna have another new feature coming out. It's gonna be in the June release. It's gonna be on June 15. And that is that you can report a zero payroll record. And so um, this will actually probably be a little bit easier than actually going in and confirming missing payroll. So if you know someone is not working in that period or you just simply don't have the data yet, you can report the zero record. And that zero record will basically say like, okay, this person didn't work, there's no payroll information report, zero. If you report that on a timely matter in your earned period report, and then they run the retired annuitant fee, or when we turn the projections on, you won't be assessed the fee for that either. So there'll be now two basically workarounds to try to prevent getting the fee. One, going in and confirming missing payroll, and then two, doing the zero payroll line. Um, I'm going to skip over these fees. Tim actually made a good suggestion, and I didn't make it. I should have did this slide first. So for online reporting, and I know a lot of you guys don't do online reporting, most of you do the XML reporting. The only fields that you're really gonna have to enter for this is the begin date and the end date, and then the transaction type. You won't have to actually enter in any earnings or other information. You'll just have to put the zero pay rate in there. For um, XML reporters, You'll do that during your earned period reporting. This is kind of an example of what it's going to look like in your XML file. All the technical specifications will be available prior to the June 15 release. I was talking to Carlos earlier. He works in the payroll area, and he believes it'll be available at the end of this month. So all the technical um, schemas that you'll need, I think schema is the right word, um, will be available at the end of the month. So you can give it to your third-party developer so that they know that they can do this. So remember, if it's an active member, you would do it as your earned period record. If it's a retired annuitant, you should do it on the earned period no contributions record. Um, testing environment will be available to text the, test the XML reports. And we can answer any questions you have on the XML specifications. All right, so just to recap, it's pretty simple, right? We have our Confirm missing payroll, which we've had for a while. All the kinks have been worked out on that. So you can go in there and confirm if you don't have payroll and then later go back and report it. Or two, you can just report the zero payroll line. But again, if you find out later there is payroll, please go back and re-report it. Because if you do the zero payroll line, one, you could be audited and that'd be a finding. And two, most importantly, a person could be missing out on their service credit or their final comp might not be calculated right at the time of retirement. But those are two ways, essentially, when you don't have the data on time, that you can avoid getting those pesky fees. Is there any questions? All right. 
Thank you. Oh, sorry, Vina had a question. Hi, I just wanted to check we can submit separate file for the zero payroll, like just a file for zero payroll only, separate than our regular earned period file. Um, you can you do it? You can do it in. Oh, Carlos has the answer. Yeah, that. Vina, you can do it either in your earned period report or as an adjustment report. I mean, one for zero payroll, yep. one for earned period. Yep, we'll take them. And out, one but... for retiree. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Yep. All right. Um, so that's all I had for today. And now I'm going to turn over, I think, to Jennifer Rocco, my partner in crime, and she's going to talk about Social Security. Oh, Veronica's going to come up and join me just in case. Hi, everyone. Lots of familiar faces. So we are here today to talk a little bit about Social Security. So um, we um, did a presentation, Veronica did a presentation at the last SIA um, that generated quite a bit of um, questions, not just from um, the school community, but from our employers as a whole. So um, we have been working with um, the Social Security Administration, the Internal Revenue Service, to have a series of meetings to kind of look back on prior guidance, what, you know, what information's out there, what does the Social Security Administration publish, what does the IRS publish, what have we published in the past, and what we found is they're not really in sync with one another. So um, Veronica, um, Christina, and I have undertaken a pretty big effort to try and get these three entities in sync. So as you can imagine, working with the Social Security Administration and the IRS, um, this has been uh, a struggle for us. But um, I do feel like today that we're on a little bit more solid ground. So um, what I thought we could talk about is just um, kind of where we started in our discussions, which is, you know, what does federal law cover? When do we look to federal law? And then what does state law cover and when do we look to state law? So when we get inquiries or questions from you guys, depending on the question, what area it falls in, federal law might control our answer and in other questions, state law might control our response. So I figured I would start there because it was kind of helpful for us to walk through this with the IRS and the SSA. Um, and then um, give you a little bit of details on the 218 agreement coverage and the answers we have in regards to that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about mandatory coverage and then uh, what I really want to focus on is next steps. So where are we now and then where are we going as far as the work that we're doing with SSA and IRS to um, publish some new and updated guidance that is clear and gives you all the answers that I know you are desperately looking for. So let's start with comparing federal law and state law. So there's really four areas where we look to federal law when we're reviewing um, inquiries. First is if we um, have a question regarding an employer-employee relationship. Um, next is who is an employer? Third, type of earnings that are reportable as Social Security wages. And then the final bullet is who is a retirement system member for the purposes of Social Security coverage. And that's probably um, a big one. And we when we talk about state law, you'll see why. But these are really the questions that we will always look to federal law to, um, to answer. The next thing I wanted to talk about is how um, federal law defines a member in a retirement system. So first, it's someone who's actively contributing to the retirement system. So for those of us that contribute to CalPERS, we're a member. It's someone who has retired from the retirement system. So all of our retirees under federal law are still considered to be members of CalPERS or their, retire their, their retirement system. Third is anyone that gets a pension or an annuity from the retirement system. So that, again, that is how federal law defines a member. 
So let's talk about state law. When do we look to state law? First is what is an entity's legal status, what their function is, and if they're part of a political subdivision. Second, we will look to state law to determine what positions are covered under a retirement system. And then third, we're going to look to state law to tell us who's eligible for membership in a retirement system. So this is where um, the federal law and the state law kind of have a, they clash, I'll say. When state law defines a member, you know for eligibility purposes, we're looking at did they work 1,000 hours in a fiscal year, full-time employment, if they've worked part-time, 20 hours per week or longer, or if they are already a CalPERS member, they're eligible for membership. Under state law, if someone retires, they are no longer a member of the retirement system. So that's where there's a big difference between how federal law defines a member and how state law defines a member. And that's important for the purposes of Social Security because when we're trying to determine whether a position is covered or not, federal law controls that determination. So we are going to be looking to how federal law defines a member when we do our review. All right, so who's covered? Um, there's a few um, slides here to talk about Social Security coverage. So the biggest point, 218 agreements cover positions, not individuals. So we are always going to be looking at what position is Veronica in. She's in a SSM1 position over the State Social Security Administrator team. We're not looking to her as what system is she a member? Is she eligible for membership? It's about her position and the job duties that she's performing. So we've had a lot of conversations with the IRS. They're out in the field now doing audits. Um, they actually take it a step further. And when they're talking about position, they're not just looking at the position title. They're looking at the duties that that person is performing. So regardless of the title, they're going to look to see if someone is performing a position, and let's say that they're a HR analyst. Anyone that's performing those HR analyst duties, if that HR analyst position is covered in the 218 agreement, which for you guys it would be, anyone performing HR analyst duties, regardless of the title of that position, they're going to be found to be covered by the 218 agreement, and they should be contributing to Social Security. So again, it's, it's the position they're in and the job duties that they're performing. And that's what the IRS is going to look to when they're out in the field doing their audit. Um, the next bullet, all of positions are covered unless they're specifically excluded. So there has to be an exclusion in the 218 agreement um, in order for a position not to be covered. There's some commonly excluded positions for part-time students and elected officials. I don't believe that the schools have any exclusions in their 218 agreement. There are also some that are commonly excluded positions, which it's required that they're excluded. Um, so those would be anyone who's a non-resident um, non alien with these um, visas. And there's also um, a section from the Social Security Administration, their POMS manual here, that you can reference for the required excluded positions. But generally speaking, for schools, there are no exclusions in your 218 agreement for any positions. All right, so the next point, who's covered? So if someone's hired into a position that's covered under the Sections 218 agreement, then the individual is covered for Social Security. So again, all the positions, classified positions within the schools are covered under the 218 agreement. So anyone hired with a school is covered by the 218 agreement. If for some reason maybe there is a required exclusion, maybe someone does have one of those visas, let's just say, um, they would be excluded from the 218 agreement, but then we would look at mandatory law to see if they would be covered under mandatory law. 
So um, just to recap, before I talk about next steps, it's always the IRS is always going to look to the position that the person is holding and the job duties that they're performing. So when you're looking to see if someone's, or when we're looking to see if someone's covered by a 218 agreement, I know one of the first questions that um, Veronica will ask is, well, if, if I applied to work in that position, would I be covered by a 218 agreement? And if the answer is yes, then whoever is doing those job duties should also be covered by that 218 agreement. So um, very important that we have that focus. Um, as far as next steps, so I've got like a book here of notes from the IRS and Social Security on some guidance that they've provided to us. What we are working to do is a few things. So one is we have in the past published some bulletins that are no longer available. Um, we've taken those down now because we're working with Social Security and IRS to revise and republish those. So um, you will be seeing um, a new circular letter, not, not a bulletin. We're going to publish a circular letter similar to um, what we do in our other areas. Um, what we are also working to do, I mean, recognizing that Social Security coverage is such a big issue and that there are a lot of questions, um, we're kind of the conduit for sharing the guidance that IRS and Social Security is providing with all of you. Um, so we are working to have their general counsels in attendance at the next SEAC, either by phone or in person, because we feel it's important that they're here alongside us to hear your concerns and answer your questions. Because ultimately, um, we can take the questions in, we can gather the information, and we can provide the answers, but it's really coming from them. So we've expressed um, our desire to have them come and attend the next SEAC with us, which um, we've, I think we're, we've got commitment from from one of two, so we're working on another one. Um, if for some reason they cannot attend the SEAC, we're also considering maybe a special meeting um, to um, bring the schools together and talk about the issue. So um, that's to come at the next SEAC. There'll be um, a circular letter ready to go um, with that meeting, so that way when you walk away, you can have all the information that you need to take back to um, to your schools, to your districts, um, and it will provide some clear examples around who is covered, who is not covered. I know the biggest question, I'm smiling at Vina, is about retired annuitants. So um, if, you, if you really look to what the IRS has told us and you're looking at the position they're in and the duties they're performing, if you have someone sitting next to them who's a permanent full-time person, and they're contributing to Social Security, and now you have a retired annuitant doing similar job duties and filling a similar role, they should be contributing to Social Security. So the guidance that we want to provide will give you very specific examples. There's a level, um, there's an added level of complexity when you talk about people um, moving between CalPERS and CalSTRS. So we're, we're trying to be as thoughtful as we can and make sure that we cover as many examples as we can. Um, the other thing that we're working on um, that we, we just got um, some information out to them on is how do we fix it? So that's, I think, the next biggest question. Who's covered and then how do we fix it? So um, we've provided some information up to the Social Security Administration and IRS so we can give you um, some documents, some case samples that you, so that you can go back um, and, and make uh, corrections if they are needed. So um, I know that I don't have all the answers here today, but um, we really thought it was important to kind of take a step back and make sure that we have everything buttoned up and documented for all of you because I, I would hate to give you some guidance and then you know circle back with IRS and have it change. So we want to give you one message from all three agencies at the same time so that we can all be on the same page. Um, so before I take questions, we do have some resources up here. So um, most important is our mailbox. So if you have any um, 
any cases or maybe examples that you'd like to, us to look at in our discussions with the IRS, please share them. Um, Veronica's team is manning that mailbox. We can take them into our discussions and use them um, maybe to incorporate them into FAQs or, or scenarios for you guys to take a look at. Um, the other um, resources on the screen, I think we've shared these before. These are some re um, resources from the IRS and the Social Security Administration. And then finally, um, our upcoming webinar schedule. So we do have a um, webinar coming up at the end of May for schools for their social, about Social Security and Medicare coverage. So um, I would encourage you all to attend that. I don't know how in depth we'll get on this specific topic, but um, we can certainly include some points during that webinar as well. If you wanted to encourage your districts to attend that, um, we can certainly um, incorporate some talking points. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's what I had to cover for today. Again, I know I don't have all the answers, but um, you know we're working towards getting you guys what you need, um, hopefully with the next SEAC. Um, I think having the IRS and Social Security Administration present will be helpful um, so that they can directly answer your questions and um, we could maybe step back for a minute and let you talk with them. So does anyone have any questions? I know I'm kind of running low on time. Ramona has one. Ramona Coker, Stanislaus. You said that there are no um, exclusions for schools in the two, Section 218 agreement? Correct. So the schools 218 agreement, when it was put in place, there were no optional exclusions um, in that contract. So then that would include students that we have employed at the schools would be right. there's no exclusion now? for There's no exclusion for students. You know what, there is a statewide exclusion. I'm sorry. There is a statewide exclusion. I have to look to see if that applies to the schools, you know, to like the high school. That, that's what we're talking about, right? This is high schools. Uh, to see if they are excluded, because I know that we took a statewide exclusion as a state, and I believe they're not covered, but I would have to be 100% sure that that also applies to just regular school, uh, schools and not like colleges and, um, you know, community um, schools. So let me get back to you on that one. Okay. Are yeah, there any other statewide exclusions other than um, possibly? Election workers, that's the only other uh, statewide exclusion, um, and that excludes election workers that work less than $1,800 per, uh, per year. Uh, that's, that's it. We can go back and do the mm -hmm. research and the share students. that out um, mm -hmm. via the SEAC mailbox just to, to confirm. So to clarify, though, there's no specific exclusions in the county's 218 agreement, but there is a state exclusion for student assistance, which is separate. But we'll provide that clarification. We'll send an email to um, Bill and his team, and he can publish that out to the group. There was another hand right behind you. I'm going to give it to Sean. <laughs> uh, Sean from LA County. Um, I just had a um, question. Um, and. All of a sudden, I'm drawing a blank. What was my question? Uh-oh. <laughs> It'll come back to me. OK. I think behind you, there's a couple. Oh, I know. Oh. Sorry. It's one of those See, mornings. See, take the mic away. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> no, um, do you have an anticipated uh, re, uh, release date or when you intend to publish the circular? Are you going to publish it before the next SEAC when you intend to bring the IRS and the SSA here? Or so is it the kind goal of is to publish it immediately following the next SEAC. So that way we can have the meeting share the information and publish the um, circular letter out um, right following that. And it sounds to me like, um, you know, at least one of the takeaways I have is where we're going if we have a if we have a classified or if we have a CalPERS retiree who's coming back and doing classified um, service, mm -hmm. they'll need to pay into Social Security. Is that where we're going? Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and and so great question this from Ramona, but I had the same thought. Um, what do we do in the meantime? Are we just in a holding pattern on this until we have official guidance? So um, what 
What I would say is that I would like to solidify all of this information with the IRS before you all go out and start to make changes um, because it has changed in the past as what, far as what we've heard. We'd like to get their buy-in and sign off on the information that we're sharing before we give you any direction to go out and change your practices. There's, I'm not, I can't tell you not to do that. I can only recommend that you wait until we have the IRS and SSA on the same page and giving you some clear guidance going forward. So, I mean, worst case, that would the next CX in August. August. So, yeah. If there's any um, opportunity to share the information out sooner, we would absolutely do that. I'm just, you know, knowing how long it's taken us to get just to this point where we are today, don't want to uh, overcommit and under deliver. So, I'd just like to give us that time to be able to work with them and get the answers that we need. Okay, thank you. Is Cal Sturz involved in any of this? Um, so I don't believe that we've included Cal Sturz as of right now. So I know that we have um, an action item to um, take a look at the per Sturz election process to see if that will be impacted at all by um, the guidance that we're receiving, but we have not looped them in as of today. Okay, because some of the guidance that we've seen at the past EAC meetings and also at different CASBO events has included um, retired annuitants taking positions that would, one, be against Ed Code, you know, for a STRS member. So I'm, I'm just concerned that Cal STRS may not be involved in this. And Yeah, they, they will be. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Jennifer? Sorry. Oh, over here. Let's switch to the other side of the room. <laughs> um, Sherry Hansen, Sacramento County Office of Ed. Are you going to take in your examples um, county offices that are not covered by a Section 218 agreement? Yes, absolutely. Because if the positions aren't covered by a 218 agreement, then um, we would this wouldn't be. Yeah. And we're in a kind of unique position, I think, because we use Social Security as our alternative retirement for our mm -hmm. substitutes but not yeah. for our regular employees. Yeah, so our examples will have to cover all of those different scenarios. So generally speaking, most county offices have a 218 agreement, but there are a couple, I th two, I think, that don't. So our examples will have to include that. And your situation where if you're using it as your alternate retirement plan, we'd have to include that as well. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, we'll hit all our bases. That's why, I mean, if you have examples, please share them so we can include everything. I'm Janelle Morris from San Joaquin County. Uh, so we have the 218 agreement, and we also have a, an approved qualified alternative retirement plan. So mm -hmm. just would be curious that your documentation would address that PERS retiree coming back into classified where normally our temps that are working in these classified positions aren't paying into Social Security because we have an approved alternative retirement system. So would that retiree fall under having to pay into the Social Security, or now that they're not an active PERS member, they would be paying in possibly to they the would alternative. They pay into the alternate retirement plan just like the others do, right? So or no. An extra little piece. Yeah, we'll, we'll review that. If you, yeah. if you email it in, we'll take a look at it. Okay, thank you. Hi, I know the best. Hold on. <laughs> Vina from Orange County. I know in the past I had sent an email about this question. The way I understood that retirees can't get any other benefit, so they can't pay into that alternate retirement plan. That's the way you had explained it to me. So but, that's for that's for a retired annuitant. Yeah, yeah they right. can't receive any other, other benefits, benefits under the state law. Right. That's correct. But my own question was that um, since students, I thought under the federal law, they are excluded from Social Security as well as PERS, isn't it? I don't know that it's under the federal law, but we, we have a um, state exclusion for that. I believe Publication 15 excludes them. They have to be students yeah. of that school that they are uh, working at and as attending there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But again, we can, we'll um, go back and um, that. provide that out via email regarding students. Okay. We'll have, I'll work okay. with you on it. Well, yeah. thank you very much. We have Jonathan thank Hensley you. now thank with projections. I think 
That's good. Good morning. How is everybody? So I'm here to answer the long awaited question on when are you going to turn on projections? Yes, we are going to turn on projections. How's that? All right. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> In all corners of the room? All right. Um, so I'm here to answer the long-awaited questions of when are we going to turn on projections. We are going to turn on projections with the July payroll periods. Um, the projections are going to be um, based on the actual payroll that's been reported. So today we're going to go over basically what is a projection, some benefits of the projected contributions, um, the earn period, receivable life cycle, the retirement appointment reconciliation, and some available resources. So the projections, what they do is they just identify any active appointment that has a missing payroll line. Um, we do this perspectively. We look at the current period that's being reported and see if there's any active payroll that's missing. We don't go and look backwards. We're only looking. So if you enroll somebody in July and you say that it was active in May, we're only going to look at July. Okay, just to give you some semblance on what we're doing, we're looking at what should be in the current period. My CalPERS projects both member and employer contributions for missing payroll in a current period on that receivable. What my CalPERS does to project the contributions is we look for the highest earnings in the last 90 days, okay? In that 90-day period, if we find an earning, we'll use it to project member and employer contributions. If we do not find an earning in that period, we do not project, okay? We don't feel that there's relevant information to be used because there hasn't been anything reported for us to use. Because like I said, we're trying to use actual data that's been reported to us to make sure that our projections are reasonable and as accurate as possible, okay? Now, if you report payroll, if you maintain the enrollments, if you confirm that there's missing payroll on the active appointments, we will not project anything. If you report zero payroll coming up in June, we will not project. If you report earnings that are significantly lower than a prior month, we will not project. We take what you've reported to us and we use that as reported contributions. Um, we're not gonna go and look at your payroll schedule and say, should it have been this or that? That's not what we're doing. We're just trying to make sure that all active appointments are either said that they have payroll or they don't have payroll. We're not here to police what you've reported. The projections, if a projection comes out, it's automatically reversed as soon as payroll is reported or if an appointment status is separated We'll get rid of it. And if payroll is confirmed as missing, we will get rid of the projection. The projected amount that gets reversed out is just the amount that was projected. We don't do any calculation on that. We just take what we did, we reverse it out. Um, again, if you report zero payroll for that period at a later date, we will accept that also. Okay. Um, projected contributions. They will not update a member's service. They will not update a member's um, record. So it will not go out in annual member statements. This is purely what we use in accounting to ensure that our books are whole and that we are billing and collecting correctly. Um, some of the benefits that this provides, if you guys think there's any benefits, um, it provides us with an accurate accounting of member and employer contributions um, in the PERF. Um, it ensures that a member's pension is properly funded by making sure that we're collecting all the contributions we should be. Um, it improves our pension accounting and our financial reporting. 
It gives us an accurate account of how many active members we have, should they or shouldn't they be receiving payroll, earnings. Um, it's really so that we can ensure that holistically we're getting what's reported to us accurately and correctly. And you know that our external auditors will sample and send out audit requests and ask you to confirm your payroll that you've reported to us. This helps us that if you say there's no payroll and our system says there was no payroll, it answers a lot of questions up front. Um, it establishes an accurate participant account appointment details. So if we've got 100 employees that have no payroll and you've confirmed that it's missing, it's accurate. We still have those 100 appointments and it's accurate that we have no payroll has been reported. So the question on when do we bill? So in the life cycle of the earn period, um, we start with a rate plan and an earn period. We have a payment due date of roughly 15 days after. 30 days after the, the payroll earn date, we have the reporting due. When the reporting comes due is when we're gonna look to see whether we should project. So at day 30, we're gonna say, do we have all of our appointments accurately reported? If we find that there's active appointments that don't have payroll reported, aren't confirmed missing, or have a zero line of payroll, we will then go and project at that time. If you've made a payment that covers all of that, we will not be sending out a bill. If we have an amount that's undue at that time, we will be sending out a bill for contribution saying, based on what you've paid and based on what we've projected, there's a difference, we will send out an amount owed, okay? At this point in time, we also assess a $200 fee. It's one time on that earn period. We don't do it again. We've now made your payroll whole, so any missed payroll reporting, we're done. Um, after 30 days, after we've projected, we'll look to see if contributions have been reported, paid, and the receivable is paid in full. At that time, if it's not paid in full, we will assess interest at 10%. Okay. Um, these bullets go over what I just went over. Um, if you have any questions on when we will first run this, like on what day should I expect it? I have to look because we want to start this with the July payroll periods. I'm going to be having my staff analyze when all of the June payroll periods end. So if your payroll period starts in June, I'm not going to count it as July. So it'll be somewhere between August 1st and probably the 15th was the first time we will run it um, for the July payroll periods. It runs every day. We project every night looking to see everybody's payroll who has an end date. Okay, so that's how often it runs. It runs nightly. Um, we don't go back retrospectively. We only look at current stuff that's going due. Now with the retirement appointment reconciliation, the ways to avoid projections is by maintaining your enrollments, um, confirming unposted payroll, reporting that zero line of payroll, and um, my CalPERS will not project payroll once appointments are separated or the payroll is confirmed missing and now starting now if zero payroll is reported. Okay. Some available resources are our MyCalPERS student guide. We had some circular letters that went out um, back in 2017 and 2018. Um, you can always reach out to the technical support team. They'll get us a email out to my team and we'll work with it. And then you can always call the call center. There, I will take any questions anybody has. Okay. <laughs> um, so it says that the 
projection contributions will be reversed once the line is confirmed or payroll is reported? Does that mean that the receivable will just be decreasing as that happens? Yes. Yeah, so we'll immediately, so once you confirm it in the nightly batch, it will go through and say, okay, we don't expect payroll for this. We just reverse out that amount. And if for any reason that you would have paid based on, the based on our projected contributions, if you reverse it out and you end up with a credit on that particular receivable, if you have any other unpaid receivables that are coming due, that credit will roll over to that rate plan. It moves um, before we run interest jobs because we don't want to project, we don't want to have interest uh, assessed if there is funds available within a rate plan. It currently does that every night, even though you guys aren't getting projections. Okay, if there's no more questions, we had a request during the last meeting for to bring back the round table, so I'd like to invite Brad and Jennifer back up and open it up for questions. Uh, yeah, it got a little warm all of a sudden. It was a little warm already, but what questions, Vina? Um, yeah, you know, just now we covered that social security topic mm -hmm. about, you know, how we will have another meeting. I just wanted to request that the corrections, if they can be, I mean, there are no corrections. The change is made effective, let's say, next year, because, um, IRS has that three years, three months, whatever number of days. Three months, three days. We don't yeah. want to do W2Cs for those retirees and all that. Mm -hmm. It will be a nightmare for us. So if we can, whatever change you make, please make it going forward. Yeah. Not so, making corrections. So I absolutely understand your concern. Um, ultimately, though, that is the decision of the Internal Revenue Service, not our office. So they're the ones who will tell us what corrections are required and for what time period. We can certainly be your advocate and fight the good fight for you, but um, ultimately they have um, oversight and decision-making authority when it comes to that. So um, we can have those discussions with them, um, but we'd have to defer to them on, on what they decide. I, I mean, generally speaking, it's usually the you know, the three years, three months, three days yeah. backwards and on a perspective basis. I don't know. Um, I don't know if they would be open to it. But like I said, we'll we'll do our best. Okay. Thank yeah. you. I have one other. Uh, this thing came up in our first meeting at our own county. And I just wanted to bring it to your attention. You know, we talk about uh, unfunded liability if we didn't report accurately it causes so it should be right and the question was the 10 month employees from district angle they start let's say august 25th through june 15th for example from district angle they are 10 month employee but from pers angle they are 11 month right so isn't it from they are thinking isn't it now when they retire their pay rate is added 11 times in the calculation that causes unfunded liability? Too. Yeah, that's correct. So yeah, if you have a 10 month employee, but they're really working 11 months, even be it a day in yes. that 11th month, we're gonna calculate that pay rate at full time, um, you know, based on 40 hours as well. So if you have an hourly, we're gonna convert it at the 40. So if you're doing equal payments, you should take that annual amount, divide it by 11, to come up with the monthly, and then if you're reporting hourly, back into it from there. Because if not, it does create an unfunded liability. Yeah, I just wanted to bring, I thought that was a good 
Yes. Going to say. Yeah, we Thank see you. that quite often. Thanks. Thank you, Vina. Hi, I'm Lori from Santa Clara County Office of Education. Hi. Um, for Social Security, for those um, employees who had that one time where they opted out of Social Security, and so they never contributed, right? And now they come back as a retired annuitant. Annuitant. Where does that apply for the? 218 agreement. Yeah. No, no. This are but way back in the, in the way, way back. Yeah, this could is have. not, yeah, there was a Medicare and a Social Security opt-out. So there's, we have like probably. I Do you still have employees? That, oh. <laughs> yeah. One's actually retiring um, this year. I don't know if I saw Veronica, um, but I don't think that I, if they're returning to the same employer, mm -hmm and they opted out of Social Security in the 80s or whenever that was, does their vote continue forward? So the question is, did they terminate the their employment? So they retired. Okay, so They that, return mm -hmm. as a retired annuity. They, new, new they don't get to carry it over. Yeah. Once the employment terminates, that, uh, that no vote doesn't carry with them anymore. So then they would have to contribute they to Social to Security contribute. at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, only the people who stayed in the position that never left yeah. are the ones who get to carry that no vote. Even if it's their same position? If it's the same position. Yeah. Yes, because they terminated their employment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, Robin Conchacosta. Um, Going back to Vina and, and her question about the 10, 11 months, we have a lot of school districts that are changing their calendars this okay. year. And they're kind of going back and forth on their calendars. It seems like every other year they're going from 10 months to 11 months and then back to 10 months. We've gotten kind of mixed reporting um, or, or answers on how this is going to impact their, their service credit because they're not... Their annual salary is going to remain the same, but these calendars keep shifting. Mm -hmm. and, and we're just concerned that the members are going to be taken care of, because we've heard that in, if they happen to retire during the year that this switch is made, they may end up with lower service credit than, or a lower uh, monthly Final call, allowance. right. Because normally the service isn't the major issue because a lot of times when it slips into that extra month, like 10 to 11, it's only a few days and that service credit, you know, is, is small and sometimes not even used because they've already got the full year because they got their 10 months full time. Not always, I know. But um, for final comp, yeah, I mean, it, it could impact it because if you're going from, say, a 10 month average to 11 month average, that 11 month average will reduce probably your monthly amount, right? because now you're dividing it by 11 opposed to 10. Um, but, uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, that's how we have to have a report because it has to be reported as earned. And you can't just simply take the earnings from that month that maybe they only work two days and put them in the prior or the, the next month that they are working full time or whatever that is. It has to be reported in the months they truly work. Do you have any good circulars or guidance that we can look at? Yeah, you know, we actually are working on a better circular letter to address those issues. We're looking to probably have it out in the next couple months. Oh, that's great. Yes. Thank you very we much. We do have one right now, but it doesn't have good examples in it, and we want to beef it up because we get that question quite a bit. Examples are always good. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you, Brad. Yep, yeah. yep. Vicki Lewitt from Kern COE. Um, we have substitutes who, they don't actually hold a position, they just sub. But they'll reach their thousand hours and they become a member. And when we go to set them up, the question is, what, what's their pay? Are they paid 12 months, work 12 months, paid 10 months, work 10 months, paid 10 months, work 11 months? They're, they're as needed. They're not a certain pay every, each month. We need something to denote those people. So, you know, once they qualify for a membership, they'll have to be in one of those appointments you've established on the pay schedule, and that's the pay rate that we're going to be looking at and reported. And then from there, you would just report them in the months that they earn their amount, the, their payroll. 
So if they worked three days in January, and you know, they say they got their thousand hours, and yet they reported in, they worked it three days in January, you should report three days of earnings, but with that pay rate that's on the pay schedule for the position that they qualified for, and then so on and so on. If they work full time in February, you report all days they worked in February, but that same consistent pay rate for that position that they qualified under. Well, of course, that that is how they're reported. But then, are they going to be part of the? Um, receivable that's calculated because say they didn't work in oh March. you're talking about like for projections yeah okay yeah so for projections no they wouldn't be because at that time they didn't qualify for a membership and then what will end up happening is once they do qualify then we'll have you re-report that the projections isn't going to um, look back and say oh wait a second you didn't report this person back in June um, when they didn't qualify, it's just going to be from that point forward. So once you key that information in and that, pay, that payroll is retroactively reported, you're going to be okay. But then going forward, if you, of course, fail to report the payroll, then they're going to be part of the projections. Unless, of course, you do the zero payroll line or confirm missing payroll. But anything retroactive, it's the... The, um, if I'm not mistaken, the projection feature isn't going to be a retroactive thing that we apply once we get new appointments in. It's just going to be for the new payroll earned period reports going forward. And John shaking his head, so good job. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I really wasn't asking you about retroactive. I, of course, they wouldn't be part okay. of that. But going forward, say they work their get in their 1,000 hours in March Okay. and become members. Okay. And then they don't work in April. Okay. Or they it, don't work in June. So, you, so if you don't accept their appointment or you don't put them on a leave of absence, let's say that you're just keeping on the book as active, then you should use the zero payroll line okay. or confirm missing payroll. Mm -hmm. And then you'll avoid the fee. Unfortunately, though, if you don't do that, then yeah, they could be subject to a projection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. I love the theory behind the zero payload, payroll line. Okay. Right now, we don't have our software systems probably aren't programmed to have the ability to do that. Okay. And that's, I guess that's what we're trying to say. Yeah, I, it's great, and I'm, we're glad you did this. We didn't know it was coming. Maybe we could have got out in front of it with our software systems if we had of, and maybe try to get the program ready, but it's not. Right, okay. So we're probably looking at six to eight months. And I just don't think you guys realize how much work this has thrown on us with confirming these payroll lines for substitutes. Because, I mean, Vicki, how many districts do you have? 54 districts that you're doing reporting for in Kern County? So she's doing 54 districts. We're doing, we don't have as many districts, but we've got some large ones, Elk Grove, San Juan. It's a lot of lines to confirm just for subs. Okay. So what she was saying is, isn't there some way where you have like a 10 month, an 11 month, and a 12 month employee, where you could have another option that is an intermittent substitute. To perhaps, that would help us more than anything. I mean. So another kind of appointment? Yeah. 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 I don't know. So you would know that these are people that work intermittently. I mean, we have subs, you know, that come and go. I mean, and we have districts that share subs, right? Twin Rivers and Natomas are right next to each other. You know, some sometimes the subs over here in Natomas work, and sometimes she's over here in Twin Rivers. You know, it's just and there's it creates a ton, a ton of work for us. This has. Yeah. yeah I'm sorry, I know we complain about this all the time. No, but. I understand. It's it is a lot of work. I mm -hmm. I yeah. I totally understand that and. And, um, you know, that's why we, we did want to do the zero payroll line. Just unfortunately, when you try to make changes to the system in the Mike Calper system, it's not something we can just turn on overnight, right? So we identified it, we prioritized it, and we tried to get it in as soon as we possibly could. And, you know, and we appreciate it's that. butting up against when we're turning on the projections, obviously. We do appreciate that you're trying to help us. It's just you have to understand that even getting our software vendors to program that is gonna be a little bit of a challenge. It may be something that we end up having to pay for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not just, it's like, oh, zero pay lines, yeah, it sounds great, except we can't do it. We don't have that option. Okay. So. We've got one over here. Oh, hi. hi, Debbie from Fresno County Office of Ed. I want to go back to the reporting out of class hours worked, Tim. <laughs> yeah. He thought he was off the hook. I can answer it. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt, but you cut me off earlier. Uh -huh. um, 
my question was, the presentation that you gave, which was very nice and very detailed, um, stated that we're in the room are going to be the ones to see that. Our districts won't have that advantage. But, and so we're to get that information out. But you said, mentioned that there's going to be a letter sent out in June to the county offices and the districts. What I'm wondering is, can that letter not be sent to the district, since we're already going to be telling everybody about this, that the county offices can give the direction, because what I see is two things. All county offices don't give their districts access, and a lot of times the districts don't understand what those things are, and we're just gonna end up with a ton of calls at the county office anyway. So if we got the letter and we sent out the direction and the training how we wanna do it, is that a possibility? Well, I was going to suggest when you tell everybody, just warn them the letter is going to come. So in regards to training, Annette here and myself, we're doing a very nice tango together. There is going to be instructor-led guides, computer-based training guides. They'll be able to know. And this all should come out hopefully before the letter even gets sent. And so now we're notifying you as a county office. It's going to probably be sent the very last week of June notifying every agency, all public agencies and all school employers, that for the month of July is your reporting period. And because there's 56 of you and not all of you are um, equal, nor do you guys choose the same path, some of you want your districts to do it, others you don't, we can't right. make exceptions here or there right. when we have to do a blanket communications. That's where it really depends on the relationship that the county office has with their districts. So if you guys know that this letter is going to go out in, in June, and we're going to have training and all that stuff available before the letter goes out with the circular letter. The circular letter and the training will hopefully come out before the notification letter comes out. You can either say, hey, circular letter came out, please ignore it, we're going to do all your reporting for you, or you can say, through whatever bulletin you guys have, circular letter came out, the training resources are there. You are now required to do this because we don't have access to your personal action forms. So you should have a window of time between when the notice goes out and the training and the circular letter to make that decision. But because some of you do the districts and some of you don't want the districts report, it's not like we can go Stanislaw, yes, Fresno, yo, no, Laco, yes, Orange County, no. I mean, it's hard, right? So it's one notice that goes out. But we hope, Danette and I and the teams, to have all that education out well in advance of the uh, actual notice to start reporting. Um, Sheila Walker, Tama County Department of Ed. We're coming into summer work, and I have some districts that um, provide um, summer lunches, and a, they, a different county pays them, and they have a, a contract that agrees what the people are going to be paid, not necessarily off of that district's salary schedule. So what rates do we use for summer pay? Well, one, would they qualify for membership? They're met. already members. They do. They are members. So they would have to be tied to the most similarly situated um, position, and whatever position that is, that's the pay rate that should be reported. Okay, not necessarily what they're paid, but it's reported. Correct. Because then that will reduce their service credit. Right. I mean, for us, we just need the transparency. So that way, when someone goes to retire, we'll, we'll match them up to the pay schedule and say, okay, they're position A, let's say, and the pay rate in position A at that step is $20 an hour. That's what we would expect to see if that's the position they're in. But if you reported something over that or below that, then it would call in question, and then we'd have to work with you to see what that should be. Yeah, we'd, we'd probably want to take a look at the contract um, just to look at the terms and what's contained within it from a membership perspective to make sure that they're being reported by the appropriate entity, and then we can take that and work with Brad's team on the um, compensation piece and the pay rate piece of it. So if you could send that in, that would be great. Yeah. Okay, well, half the time I don't know about it till after it's already done and I'm <laughs> reporting and I'm saying, where are you getting these rates from? Well, we contracted with this other county. Yeah, we'd want to see them. that. We'd want to take a look at that contract and make sure that they're being appropriate uh, or reported by the appropriate county as well. So if someone could share that, we'd like to take a look and then we can work on that. Okay, and I'm probably remembering wrong, but when um, you have summer school, sometimes summer school, they pay them a higher rate than what they normally get 
during the year for the same position. Are, we're okay to report that higher rate. Um, and that is that higher rate on the pay schedule? Is it a different step? Is it? It's a different step, but it is on yeah, the salary schedule. Then yeah, if it's a different step and it's not considered overtime, then yes, you would report that higher pay rate. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Lena from Orange County. I was just going to say what Sheila was mentioning about the same position in summer okay. with a higher pay rate. Uh, I think PERS had us reverse the higher pay rate and make us report at the, the consistent, regular yeah, 10 you months. Know, after I answer that, I, I, I kind of want to go back and, and look at the specific example because there's so many different ways people have pay schedules set up and different roles because we do normally want a consistent pay rate. And, you know, if, if the person's really working in the same position and it's the same duties, you know, why are they getting a higher amount in the summer? Is it because it's like a per unit type of thing or is it overtime? You know, there's a lot of different scenarios that play into it. Yeah, sometimes community colleges especially, they want to offer incentive to work in summer. Uh -huh. So they have a different salary schedule, approved schedule. So there's an actual so, schedule? Schedule, yes. Mm -hmm. Is it, and it's the same appointment? Uh, see, Are they that's moving the into problem. that new? That's the thing, yeah. like they, let's say they teach math 10 months, but then again they are teaching math in summer, but for regular job, they might get $70, but for summer, yeah. they're getting $120. Yeah, I mean, I think ideally, if it was a different position, right, and you put them, move them into that appointment, and it's on, and there's a pay schedule for it, then you would require, would we be able to report the higher pay rate? But if you're leaving them in that same appointment, same position, we're going to expect a lower amount. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there's just a lot of different ways to, to yeah, look at it. Actually, I had it on my list if our next meeting we could we okay. can clarify for summer jobs how to report summer jobs if yeah. they have same position and that's another it, yeah yeah i and, see stephanie writing that down right so and actually too it. that's another thing we want to address in another circuit letter too um you know we're trying to we have a lot of the same questions coaching stipends right which I hope we don't have any coaching have stipend questions it. right now, but coaching stipends, um, reporting summer months, equal payments. So, you know, considering that we always get the same questions, I know we kind of have these really older circular letters that don't have good examples, or maybe the, the way that we um, look at it now has changed slightly. So we actually are looking at um, drafting three or four different circulars for schools actually specifically to help clarify all of this type of stuff. You know, um, one of the tougher parts, especially when you're answering you know, here we're not able to actually see it is exactly. you, there's so many different scenarios that right. come into play. Yeah, sometimes maybe the higher period is the right thing to report, but in other cases it's not. Um, so it's it's tough to really give a, a answer that's consistent without looking at everybody's. And also like Tim had mentioned earlier, a lot of schools do things a lot of different ways. Even though you do things very similar, there's all these little variances sometimes too. So if I give a blanket answer, it might work for you guys, but it might not work for them. Um, so that's where we are looking to do those circulars to help clarify the information. And second thing is I understand uh, you are working on the walk-on coaches, some circular is coming up. Yes, exactly. We're trying to capture all those hot topics that we yeah. continually. I wanted to request if we can also cover whether they should be counted in 1,000 hours or not. Their yeah. hours, yeah. because you cannot really measure how right. many hours they, they work. Would. You can measure the pay rate. Yeah. So district's concern is they make them a member, but then you can't report them. So yeah, a lot of times it seems like to me with the coaching stipends, it's not something reportable. It's kind of a one-time stipend. You're paying them a one-time payment to be the the coach or of whatever sport it might be, and it's really not something truly intended for your membership. Yeah, but if right. you wanted to go that route, then you yes, you can create a, a position on your pay yes. schedule, make an appointment, but then they have to qualify, right? Yeah. They have to work the thousand hours or the once a member, always a member. So. Again, it kind of it depends on how the the route that you want to go. Right. Just give us black and white answers. Yeah, there's not. That's the problem, right? <laughs> this is Cal. This is this is. It's she complicated, makes it sound right? So easy. Yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah. This, I mean, that's what you have to do. Make it easy. Right. We're well, trying. We I think the answer I gave is kind of black and white, right? It's like. 
if you want to go that route to make it a valid position on your pay schedule and you want to make an appointment, then you can do that. But yes. then just remember, there's membership rules that apply. Exactly. The thousand hours, the once member, always member. You have to have a consistent pay rate, right? You can't be fluctuating just up and spell down. spell it out. All right. Just spell, just spell it, out. it out. Black and white. Step. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we're going to try to spell all those things out, the summary <laughs> reportings and all of that, Thank too. So. You know, like, you know, to her question that she mentioned earlier, you know, I, it potentially could be the higher one, but then, you know, if it's not documented up properly or there's certain specifications, maybe it's not. Um, a lot of times it isn't, right? But it depends on if you're moving people between appointments and things of that nature. Yes. Are we, oh, go ahead. I have a question from the web um, about out of class. Would you clarify the following questions? One, does the district have to report all employees who work in the out-of-class appointment even if they do not reach a 960-hour limit? And if an employee goes over the 960-hour limit, how will the penalty be calculated? Is it based on the hours they go over the limit or the entire hours they work in the out-of-class yeah. appointment? So, so yes, if anyone is in an out-of-class appointment, even if they only worked one hour, yes, you, should, you still need to report it. In the day, you won't be penalized, but that's part of the, the statute is, yes, you must report them. And um, you know the enhancement Tim talked about earlier should make that pretty easy to do. And then two, if you are assessed a penalty, it's gonna be for the entire time. So if someone, say, worked 1,000 hours, and they didn't pay contributions on the time they were in the upgraded position. They, you know, they met all the rules, and yes, it turned out there was penalty. It'd be based on the full thousand hours, the difference between the position that they truly are in and the upgraded position. We would take that difference, multiply it by three, and that's your penalty for that. The other question is. Do we report if the position is vacant, filled by an out-of-class assignment, but the recruitment has not yet been posted? So that's, it's kind of tricky with the recruitment. Um, for us, recruitment doesn't mean it was something that's publicly posted. It just means that you initiated the process of recruiting. Right. So yes, if, it's, if you are working with your HR office to recruit for it, we consider that a recruitment. All right. Well, it looks like that was the last of our questions. So, um, Bill, do you want to step up or? Okay. All right. Thank you. Swan, thank you, everybody. Um, enjoy your lunch. Thank you.